Let's pray together. Father, it's a blessing to come into your house, to join with others of like mind and faith, to be able to worship together, to be revived, to be renewed, to be reminded of the great love of our Savior. In that name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Y'all made it in the cold. It was below freezing this morning on the way out, and it was just a just a, not a good morning to try to go out in the outside, wasn't it? But we're here to worship. We'll warm up inside, and then we'll head back into it. I want to point you into your bulletin for a few announcements. And of course, there's the tear-off tab in there if you've got prayer requests or any way that the church can help you in your walk with Christ. You can fill that out and drop it in the offering boxes. Um, you'll also notice we've got baskets uh, up front and in the back uh, for our Meals on Wheels offering that's noted in the bulletin there. Now, I think technically we've done this in the past on Super Bowl Sunday, so we're, we're about a week early, but that's okay. If you miss it this week, you can hit it next week. We'll try to have those baskets out again next week. This week we've got church council on Monday, business meeting on Wednesday, and um, no choir practice the night of the, the business meeting. And then lastly, uh, Sylvia is going to come talk about some WMU events coming up. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to start out this morning uh, mentioning that uh, the secretary made a error uh, in the bulletin, I mean, uh, in the uh, newsletter, the February newsletter, I accidentally, I guess I had February on my mind when I was typing, and uh, anyway, the ladies' tea party is going to be on March the 27th and not February the 27th, so uh, that was, that wasn't my only mistake for the year. <laughs> I'm not starting out too well this year, but. Anyway, uh, I did want to bring that to everybody's attention that I did uh, put in the, and if you'll pass it along, that it is March the 27th. Of course, that's a month away, and we've got plenty of time to get the word out. Uh, but we had our first uh, WMU meeting, and we, the ladies that we uh, that attended, we did have, uh, we went over uh, our yearly plans, uh, and we missed some of you, and we hope maybe the next, we're having our next meeting on the 16th of this month. So hopefully we'll get more to attend because uh, we do have a lot of things that we want to bring before the church and all of the ladies of the church. If you can't come to the meetings, we still, uh, uh, you are still a part of the WMU. So uh, we hope that maybe uh, you can help us all during the year. Uh, I've got two things I wanted to mention today. I did bring my notes just in case I make another boot on my dates. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Right after, uh, two things, it's going to be the Baptist Women's Day. That's the most important thing right now is uh, to get everything planned for February the 20th. Uh, our speaker is going to be uh, Susan Campbell. She's from the Blue Ridge Pregnancy Center. And in the past, uh, last few years, our ladies, uh, the whole church has been involved in baby bottles campaign. So we feel uh, this time when we do the Baptist Women's Day, we're going to start, we're going to kick off the uh, baby bottle campaign at the same time. We thought this would be very appropriate since uh, she is from the Blue Ridge Pregnancy Center. So anyway, uh, we'll have someone at the end of that service to take up, the, uh, to give out the baby bottles. I did want to mention, uh, got some news this week, uh, the total that we gave last year for the baby bottles is $500.63. So I think, you know, our church needs a, I think we really did, really did good, and we're hoping maybe this year we could do the same and maybe a little bit more if possible, but we do thank you for the support, and I know that this is a good cause. Uh, see, the only, uh, we have, and of course, uh, when we have the uh, Baptist Women's Day, we will have a uh, ladies' choir. And Jessica wants to meet with everybody next Sunday that wants to sing in the choir for the day, for that day. So uh, she'll be getting with y'all on that. Uh, also, want to thank I, I want to thank the uh, the Baptist men. 
we uh, they had a good they had a good uh, program that day. I want to thank all the ones that uh, participated in that, and uh, hopefully y'all support the ladies when we have our day. Uh, uh, the last thing I wanted to say is that uh, at the end of the service, I do want to meet with uh, the ones that uh, were, were planning on helping with the Baptist Women's Day, and also the ones that are helping with the ladies. We do have a lot to go over. I know we've got uh, a month away before the tea party, but it takes a lot of planning, and uh, we, we hope we'll have a good turnout for it. So, and we need to spread the word that that is going to be the day that we will be having the tea party. So anyway, thank you for your attention, and uh, thank you. Good morning. Let's stand and sing hymn number 66, To God Be the Glory.
take some time this morning and go to the Lord in prayer. I want to talk to you about our missionaries of the week, and this is Ryan and Trisha McKemmick. No, they they give us these um, these speaker notes, and I, I'm just it's too good for me to paraphrase, so I'm just going to read it to you straight in the beginning. You ready? Today in our missions prayer time, let's grab a glass of iced tea and head to Georgia. So you just you just can't let that go. You know, you gotta use that one. We want to pray for Ryan and Tricia Mackamack, two of our North American missionaries serving in the Atlanta area area. In twenty sixteen they moved there with their eight children. <laughs> you need a, need a bus just to get okay. Um, and planted Gospel Hope Church in Avondale Estates a city east of downtown Atlanta within its famous 285 Beltline. This is a part of DeKalb County that has struggled with racial issues and low incomes. And Ryan is leading Gospel Hope Church to focus on discipling believers and planting more churches. They've launched small groups around the area to help. Church welcomes all people, a fact reflected in its multicultural staff and membership. One man who visited it had been to church, but at Gospel Hope, he grasped what the gospel means and became a follower of Jesus. And now he leads a ministry team and is preparing to become a pastor. Our church supports Ryan and Tricia through our cooperative program giving. Let's pray they'll continue to impact lives as they represent Christ throughout their area. Thank you. That was a good one today. The rest of our prayer time, I want you to take you to our church prayer list. And... Um, First, remember those that are in nursing home care. We've got um, a little bit of a list here I want to read off for you. Ruth Mason, Keith Cumby, Francis Peters, Edith Lyons, Shirley Lyons, Eula Martin, Bob Nelson, and Joanne Bryant. One more request for this morning. Um, we need to pray for Sean Hargis. And I just found out he's been in the hospital and ICU since Wednesday uh, with an aortic dissection. And if you're not familiar with what that means, aorta split a little bit. So like serious things going on there. And some other issues they're trying to sort through. So we want to pray for healing. We want to pray for wisdom for the doctors and they sort out what's going on there. And if you get a chance on the way out, Cindy and Trey can use a hug. That's okay. I can get huggers. Okay. Let's take all these things to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the blessings you give us. We also come to you in times when things aren't going well, and we come and we say, Father, we need your help. We lift up those that are in nursing home care, and we know that can be a lonely place to be and can be a difficult place to be, and we pray that you would remind them of your presence with them today. I want to lift up Sean as well, and as he's at... Lynchburg General and working with those doctors, you ask that you would give the doctors wisdom to know what's going on. You'd help them to know the right course of action for treatment and give Sean healing that can only come from the mighty hand of God. Also lift up this missionary pair in Georgia as they're working and sharing the gospel there, and we ask you to give them opportunities to do that, that they would be bold in their witness, that people would come to know you, and that the message of the gospel would spread all throughout Atlanta. All these things we lift up in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
kids are headed downstairs. Last week we looked at Genesis 2, and if that was the week where everything was awesome, then this is the week of the train wreck as we go into Genesis chapter 3. If you ever ask yourself, where did everything start to go wrong? The question is answered here in Genesis chapter 3. It's one of the classic stories of the Bible, and if you're familiar with it, you know we've got Adam and Eve, and they eat of the fruit of the one tree God told them not to, and um, kind of read through this going, no, there's nothing you can do about it. This morning, we're not going to focus on the tree or the fruit. This morning, I want us to look at this passage and bring to light the deception and the character of Satan. And we're going to notice and verbalize the influence there, because Satan still pulls the same old tricks. And we see throughout scripture places like Ephesians 6 that tell us our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual powers of darkness. And so if we're going to realize we put on spiritual armor, it goes on to talk about armor of God. It's helpful for us to be aware and know what Satan's tricks are. And so we're going to look in here and see what's going on. Read with, along with me Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field the Lord God had made and he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Let's pray before we go into this passage together. Father, as we look in here, we ask that you would give us eyes to see what's really going on here. That we would notice the sin and the rebellion and see the connection and how Satan still works in our world today. That we may defend against it. That we may shield people from it. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I want you to see first the beginning of um, verse 1. We have stage left, enter serpent. And stage right, here's Eve in the garden, and the serpent speaks. Now on the surface level, I want us to take a moment briefly and just say, let's not look at this and say, ooh, serpent. No, there's more going on here. This is not just a snake. Let's look briefly with me. Um, Luke 10, 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. References that, and then we look into Revelation chapter 12, and there's a backstory. Revelation chapter 12, 7 through 9, it says, Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. Here's our key phrase. That ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And so we need that context. We bring it back into Genesis, and we see this is not just a snake. This is Satan himself here. It's important we make that connection because we have to realize right off the bat, this is not a story about snakes and how terrible they are, although I'm not a big fan of snakes, but that's not what this story is about. It's important we see this is not a sign that God's creation was bad. God did not make a bad part of creation, we have to see from the very beginning that Satan is here, which is our first point this morning. 
Satan comes disguised, hides, comes to them in the form of a snake. You know, sometimes I think when we talk about Satan and and this God and Satan thing going on, we think that Satan's going to be obvious and transparent, that it'll be painfully obvious to tell where Satan's influence is. It's almost like we expect in this passage that it should have read, Adam and Eve were in the garden and a man walked up and said, hi, my name is Lucifer. I've been battling God for ages. It's just been an ongoing thing. Just trust me, God's the worst. I'm the winner. Don't you want to join my team? Why don't you eat some of that fruit and we'll show God who's boss? Because that's what Satan is doing here. It's what he's trying to do. He's trying to incite rebellion. He's trying to start a problem, but he's not showing up with a name tag on. He shows up disguised, hidden. We know this is the way Satan works. You know, when Satan interacts with Job, Job never gets to even know Satan is there. He doesn't know what's going on. He just looks at his life and goes, oh my goodness, everything is falling apart. We know from the narration Satan is involved. Job doesn't get that. Satan doesn't show up and plop plop down in Job's house and say, ah, my name is Lucifer. I'm here to test you. Satan comes disguised. No introduction, no explanation, no history, no motive, doing his absolute best to stay invisible. Don't pay attention. It's not me. It's just a snake. Tries to start trouble without being noticed. Number two, Satan brings doubt. Says to the woman, the rest of verse one, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Come on now. Satan knows what God said. He's trying to stir the pot, trying to create doubt, create uncertainty. You notice that um, God's command to them was not to not eat any of the trees. God's command was that one particular tree was off limits. So Satan comes and says, can you believe that God? He told you not to eat from any tree. It's kind of hard with the tone. We don't know where he's leaning at, but either Satan's trying to say, That God, he is withholding from you. He won't let you have nice things. Or he's saying, did God really say that? Are you you sure you're remembering correctly? Did God really? Are you sure that's what God said? Our world does this. Satan speaks through the world, oftentimes related to God's word, and people will say, did did God's word really say that? that? Is that really what it says? Or they'll say, can you believe that God, that he would say such a dirty, nasty thing? Bringing doubt, trying to ask questions, trying to get Eve to look around and, and go, well, I don't, I don't know. Well, that, you're right, that something is messed up about that. Eve knew what God had said. She gives a response that shows it. It says, we can eat of the fruit, the trees, the garden, but God said, you can't eat from that one, and if you do, you're going to die. Satan comes back and responds again. Number three, Satan speaks lies. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. We look at this verses four and five, and I want you to see there's a progression here. There's a, there's this, in this sentence, we start off with a bold-faced, outright, can't even call it anything other than pure lie, and we dwindle down through some half-truths all the way to a little nugget of truth right there at the end. The very beginning, Satan says, you will not surely die. That's an outright lie. You can't, can't say two ways about it. You go back and look into Genesis 2.17, and God clearly says, of this tree you shall not eat, for the day you eat of it you will surely die clear, unmistakable. And Eve knew it, but then he, from there he continues on with these half-truths and these twisted logic, these little twists, and Satan saying, well, if you eat this, then God knows you're going to become like God. And on one hand, there's this little bit of truth there, because if, if you, they do eat this fruit, there is knowledge that's gained, there is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there's something there, that little half-truth, But the implication, the falsehood there is Satan's trying to say, don't you want to be like God? Because you're not right now. 
God's trying to keep you back. You, you think you're special, but you're not. You, God is holding back from you. God is not treating you right. Don't you want to be like God? The implication being that they're not. But Adam and Eve are more like God than any other part of creation. We looked and we saw how Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. They're more like God than the serpent more like God than the angels. They're made in the image of God. They don't have to eat the fruit to be like God. They already are. See, this twisted logic and, and as I say, said, Satan ends with this little twist of truth saying if they eat the fruit, they'll know the difference between good and evil. Well, duh. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Like, it's in the name, right? But Satan gives them this little twist of truth Right there, the tail end. We started off with the lie. And his goal is that Eve's going to hear what he says and go, oh, well, you're right. If I eat, then, yeah, I mean, knowledge of good and evil and then more like God. And, yeah, I mean, I, I won't die, right? He's hoping that this, the lie that he speaks is going to continue twisting with this doubt and get Eve to do something she knows she's not supposed to. But we look a little bit deeper, and I want you to see the real lies underneath this. And we look at Satan bringing doubt and Satan speaking lies and how they're connected to each other. And there's a common link here that Satan is trying to drive this relational wedge. And underlying this, when, when Satan says, did God actually say, or, or you, you're not going to really die. What Satan is trying to say is he's trying to say, God can't be trusted. This God that you claim to follow, this God you claim to worship, you can't actually trust him, is the lie that Satan is trying to bring into this. You, trying to bring this independence, you, you don't need God, because if you can have this fruit, you can be like him. You can't trust him anyway, he's holding back. He knows this would be good for you, but he's not giving it to you. He knows you're not going to die is this lie that is trying to say God can't be trusted. This lie that's saying God is withholding good things from you. Satan doesn't come out and say it directly. He comes disguised. But subtly, under it all, that's where it is. And he wants Eve to finish this conversation thinking that God is her enemy. He wanted her to think God was against her. He wanted her to think that God was lying to her. He wanted her to think that God was refusing to give her good gifts. Ever had thoughts like that when you're praying sometimes? Pray for something, you've got to identify it as a good gift and it doesn't happen and you get that little like bump in the back of your mind that goes, that God, if he was really good, he'd give it to you. That is a lie from Satan that goes as old as back here. The thought that if God doesn't give us what we want, that he's not good. The thought that if God doesn't give us all of the things that he's holding out on us, that he's not giving us the good things. But scripture says every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. If there's any goodness, any gift, anything worth having, it comes from the Father. He wanted her to think that she didn't need God. If only she had that fruit. If only she would eat that fruit, she'd be like God herself. And then she could have what God has, and then she could be self-sufficient. If only she ate that fruit, she could live life on her own without God's influence. See, this passage, as we dig deeper into it, it's not about the fruit on a tree. It's about trusting in the goodness and the love of God and submitting to what he has said is the way to live. And Satan brought Eve to this point in a disguise with doubt and with lies. What happens next, of course, Satan is perfectly pleased with because, number four, Satan justifies rebellion. See, Satan knew he'd, Eve had to make the decision for herself, but it comes to verse 6. The beginning of verse 6 says, So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. Do you hear the justification in there? In fact, if you haven't read Genesis 1 and 2, and if you only come to verse 6, and you say, Eve has the opportunity to eat from a tree that is good for food. It's a good tree. It looks good. 
and it's going to make her wise. If you don't know anything else about chapters 1 and 2, and all I read to you is that, you might go, yeah, go Eve, that's good. It's a good decision right there. Good job. Eve's got this justification here as she's saying, okay, well, it's, it's good for food. It's going to look good. It's going to taste good. It's going to give me wisdom. I, well, that, that sounds good to me. The big problem with it is that she's missing the one consideration that's most important that cancels everything else out, and that is that God's already said, don't do it. And rather than looking and saying, well, I know that it might look good, and I know it might taste good, and I know it might sound good, but God said no, so I'm just going to leave it alone, thanks, and go over here and get some of this fruit and this fruit. Satan loves it when we justify our sins like that. Come up with a reason in our heads why it might make sense. Try to sort it all out and say, we've ah, we've figured this out. I can make this work. So Eve eats the fruit. Got to look at the rest of verse 6. And we find here is number 5. Satan exploits passivity. For those of you, by the way, that are used to a three-point preacher, don't worry. We've only got six. We're, we're headed there. I'm not going on for 25. Here we go. Number five, Satan exploits passivity. Look at the end of verse six. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now take a moment and realize what that says. That says that Eve took a bite and gave some to her husband who was standing right next to her. It it doesn't say that she took a bite and then finished that piece of fruit and picked seven more and took it home and waited for Adam to come in from the field and said, look what I found. It it doesn't mean that she had to go find him or that he popped up later. He was standing right, it's more like, here honey, you try it. He was standing right there. The whole time that Satan is talking to Eve, Adam is right there. He hears the whole thing. He encounters the whole conversation. He knows the whole time what's going on. And Eve's getting like, oh, well, I guess it looks good. And he's standing there watching her like, oh, squirrel. Standing there the whole time. And the whole time Satan's got to be thinking, sweet, Adam's not doing anything. Satan doesn't have to talk to Adam. Adam's already taken the bait hook, line, and sinker. Adam's in. Eve says, here, honey, and I goes, okay. Um, the whole time. It's interesting. I'm going to read a passage from Romans chapter 5. Paul gives a little bit of exposition on this, and he says, talking about um, how sin entered the world and God's plan to solve it. And in Romans 5, verse 12, he says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who would come. You notice whose name's in there? It's not Eve. It's the sin of Adam. It's the transgression of Adam. It's death reigned from Adam. But I just read that Eve ate first. Now I'm going to acknowledge for a brief second that there could be some literary things going on. The author could be like, remember Adam and Eve and lumping them together with Adam and sure. But I think there's something deeper going on here that fits with what Jesus talks about how sin starts in the heart. Jesus says if you've hated someone in your heart, you have committed murder. The heart attitude carries it. And my theory here, what I want you to look at is that it's entirely possible that Adam sinned first because Adam was on board with it long before Eve took a bite. And my theory here is that Adam sinned first by being okay with it in his heart before he took a bite and ate. It's consistent with what Jesus told us. Now I'm I'm acknowledging to the look of... um, of questioning from my wife in the back going, are you speaking heresy up there? What are you doing? So I'm acknowledged, take some time, study it yourself and look at it. But I'm saying, this is what I want you to see. Eve ate 
Adam was right there next to her and ate right afterwards. And in Romans, Paul says the sin and transgression of Adam is what, how sin entered the world. And I'll let you reconcile those together how you will. But at the very least, what we definitely can say here is that Adam saw passivity. He saw that Adam wasn't going to do anything about it. And Satan took advantage of that. Lastly, number six. Satan avoids consequences. Notice, though, by this point, Satan is actually kind of gone. Or at least the last time that he's mentioned is in verse 5. Eve eats, and then Adam, and then verse 7 begins to describe this fallout. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Remember, Satan's in disguise. He's just caught trying to cause trouble. He's not going to stick around to deal with the consequences. Satan spent a good amount of energy convincing them there wouldn't be any consequences. Don't worry, you can eat this fruit. It'll be fine. You're not going to die. God's just being mean. But he didn't stick around to help him find fig leaves. It doesn't say Satan, you know, they eat and Satan goes, all right, welcome to the team. I'm glad you signed up. Adam and Eve eat, and Satan slithers off. And Adam and Eve have to look around and go, my goodness, what do we do now? Snuck away like, well, good luck with that. It's not my problem. <laughs> Gotta go. Mission accomplished. You guys have fun with that. Let's recap. We have to recognize the tricks of Satan to fight against them. Satan comes disguised. Satan brings doubt. Satan speaks lies. Satan justifies rebellion and exploits passivity, and Satan avoids consequences. It's important for us to recognize that, and it's important for us to speak it out loud because Satan tries to hide. He doesn't want us to notice. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 6 that our battle is not against flesh and blood, because Satan wants to start fights and let us fight amongst ourselves. Satan wants to distract and let there be distance between us and God. Satan wants Adam and Eve from this point on to blame one another, and we'll get to that next week. We're going to stop and we will say that and we'll say, okay, we have to acknowledge that's the way Satan is. But then let's also fight against the lies of Satan with the truth of God. There's going to be a rhythm to this. Praise the Lord, our God is nothing like that. Whereas Satan comes disguised, our God comes in plain sight. Born of a virgin, crucified, buried, and rose again. Jesus came claiming to be the Son of God and got killed for it. Now it's what he wanted, it was the plan. God came that he would die, that he would raise again, that the penalty for our sin would be paid. Our God comes in plain sight. Satan brings doubt, our God offers clarity gospel message is simply and clearly says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Satan speaks lies, but our God speaks truth. Psalm 119 says his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Satan justifies rebellion. Our God rewards obedience and saying, God says, you choose me as your savior, but you're going to choose me as your Lord. And when you do, scripture says, you obey what the Lord has said. Don't seek treasures on earth where moth destroy and thieves steal, but build up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Satan exploits passivity, but our God encourages action. Faith requires personal decision. And at the end of the day, with our faith, we determine our own level of involvement. God says, faith without works is dead. Our faith produces works. Not saved by our works, we're saved by grace through faith, lest no one should boast. And whereas Satan avoids consequences, our God took our punishment. When the price needed to be paid, Jesus showed up and said, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son. Whereas Satan slithered off into the darkness, 
God came into the darkness as the light and said, I'm going to do something about this because I'm not satisfied to see it end that way. And therein our hope lies that Genesis 3, 7 ends in a very depressing spot, but that's not the end of the story. So feel the weight of the sin, feel the weight of Satan's tricks and let that heaviness settle on you. But also remember that's not the end of the story and we look forward. We know that our God is good, loving, powerful, and worthy to be trusted. And it has been proven on Calvary. And this end of the story has been written and we can go all the way down to the end. And we're going to look at that in a couple weeks. And we're going to see eventually Satan gets himself thrown into a pit of fire. The battle has been won. We're just not there to that point yet. But we find redemption and forgiveness of sins through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Satan comes disguised, brings doubt, speaks lies, justifies rebellion, exploits passivity, and avoids consequences. But our God comes in plain sight, offers clarity, speaks truth, rewards obedience, encourages action, and took our place. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message. A message from your word that Satan and you are polar opposites, and where Satan comes to destroy, you come to bring life. Where Satan prowls around like a lion looking for something to devour, you come as the lamb sleep. Therein we place our hope. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Our last song this morning is Amazing Grace. God had every right to leave us in Genesis 3-7 and say, whoops, you messed it up. But he didn't. By the grace of our God we carry forward. Let's sing together.
We're going to take communion now. Communion is a time of remembrance. When Jesus sat with his disciples, he said, you're going to do this in remembrance of me. The connection between, we read in Genesis 3, as we see those lies of Satan, and Satan tempts us to despair. If you need a moment of remembrance to say, is the Lord good? Yes, we look here. Is the Lord powerful? Yes, we look here. Is the Lord loving? Yes, we look here. This is what communion is about, reminding us of the goodness and the grace and the power and mercy of our God and what Jesus has done and that salvation is available by grace through faith to those who turn to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We're going to distribute the elements.